Good evening. Grace and peace to all of you. My name is Molly Marshall. I'm the president here at Central, and we are honored to have you here tonight. If I begin to recognize all the important people in the room, uh, Aid Sand won't have any time to talk. Uh, but I, I do want to acknowledge that we have two uh, denominational leaders uh, among us, present ones, the new ABCCR Central Region Regional uh, Executive Minister, Dr. Greg Himmon, is here with us, as well as uh, Jeff from Heartland uh, CBF. So we are grateful that you are here. Perhaps most distinguished in our midst is the former deputy to Dr. Aidsand Wright Riggins. Uh, uh, Dr. Susan Gillies, without whom he would have managed none of what he did at ABHMS, and most recently, as you know, the acting general secretary, interim uh, secretary general of American Baptist Churches USA. We've got alums, we've got friends from William Jewell, we have faculty and staff, treasured uh, board members, and interested friends. We are very glad that you are here tonight. Uh, you will hear important things, and we'll have a time of dialogue after Dr. Wright Riggins offers his lectureship. I campaigned rather vigorously for us to get the Sheridan Lectures here at Central Seminary. For one, I think the whole world needs to know about Central Seminary. But secondly, uh, often these lectures are held east of the river and uh, do not include the whole footprint of Baptist life. And so we're really happy to have uh, Sheridan Lectures here in Kansas City and to welcome uh, staff leadership from BJC as well as our august guests tonight. Uh, to introduce Dr. Aidsand Wright Riggins, I'll call upon uh, Amanda Tyler in just a moment, but just as a word of invocation, may our God hallow this evening, kindle our minds with greater understanding, and stir in us the prophetic zeal to do what we need to do as people of faith. Amen. Amanda. Well, thank you so much, President Marshall, for that warm welcome, that beautiful invocation to our time here tonight. Um, you did lobby aggressively for this uh, lectureship, but it was, I was, it was not a hard sell. Um, we have been wanting to uh, come at, to Central. We have been partners for so long. Um, Dr. Marshall was our Sheridan lecturer uh, three years ago, um, and so it felt very right uh, for us to be here, and uh, your welcome has been unparalleled this week, um, and want to thank the entire Central family for all of um, their work to bring us here tonight um, for the 14th annual Walter B. and K.W. Sheridan Lectures on Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. Um, and I did, um, for those of you um, who uh, did not join us last night, I do want to be sure to introduce my colleague who uh, have come with me from Washington for these lectures, uh, Charles Watson, uh, our Director of Education, and Sherilyn Crow, our Director of Communications, are uh, both here um, and want to thank them for all of uh, their work to make uh, these lectures possible. So we are so excited to have um, you all here with us in the room tonight for the lectures um, and want to welcome those who are joining us on Facebook Live. Um, also, for those of you who are on social media, we want others in our conversations. So please do silence your phones, but if please feel free um, to do some live tweeting or some posting from this event. Um, and did want to point out uh, BJC's social media channels. We're on Twitter at BJC on the Hill on Facebook slash Religious Liberty, and on Instagram at Baptist Joint Committee. And I am also on Twitter at Amanda Tyler BJC. Well, um, two people who are not with us um, here in the room tonight, um, but that we do want to thank are Buddy and Kay Sheridan. 
they, their generous gift has endowed these lectures on college and university and seminary campuses in perpetuity. Our lectures travel across the country. Um, every third year, we're back at their home uh, at Mercer University in Georgia, um, but are delighted to come to new audiences like tonight at Central and last night at William Jewell. Uh, the Sheridans, um, they were both educators in their career, and they knew the importance of education to the continuation of religious liberty. They wanted uh, to see the impact of their gift in their lifetime um, and for generations to come. Uh, Kay has said that this, what we're doing tonight, will always be necessary to talk about freedom. And Buddy said, we want experts to talk on these issues. Well, tonight we are joined by a true expert in freedom and a lifetime of freedom fighting, uh, Reverend Dr. Aidsand Wright Riggins III. Uh, Reverend Riggins has, Wright Riggins has held uh, many hats over his illustrious career. He was a pastor uh, for more than uh, 20 years in Los Angeles, including uh, his last time there spent at Macedonia Baptist Church. He was a denominational executive for 24 years as CEO of American Baptist Home Mission Societies and Judson Press, and since 2015, executive director emeritus of H ABHMS, the first person to hold that title. Uh, he's an elected official. He serves as mayor of his hometown of Collegeville, Pennsylvania, uh, when, where he was elected in November 2017. And in so doing, he was the first African American to hold that position. And he's also a nonprofit leader. He currently serves on the boards of the Morehouse School of Religion in Atlanta, the Colgate Rochester Crozier School of Divinity in New York, and the Kaleidoscope Institute in Los Angeles. And BJC has been graced by his leadership. He served on our board uh, for more than 20 years and as our board chair in a critical moment of executive leadership in the late 1990s. Dr. Wright Riggins earned degrees from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, the Graduate Theological Union, American Baptist Seminary of the West, uh, California State University, and the Ecumenical Center for Black Church Studies, as well as several honorary degrees. BJC has been honored to work with you, Dr. Wright Riggins, for nearly three decades, and we are delighted to bring him here tonight to talk about freedom. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Aid Sand Wright Riggins. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, my brothers and sisters, and Dr. Marshall, thank you so very much for your hospitality and your graciousness and the opportunity to be here uh, with you tonight. Um, my lecture is probably two and a half pages longer than it should be. Uh, so uh, let me just say to all the rest of you and to way, by way of greeting that I am uh, hippopotamus happy and giraffe glad that you're here and that you came out tonight to hear this lecture. Would you just pause for me with just a moment of silence and quiet. Thank you. To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be enraged almost all the time. James Baldwin. In the spring of 1969, I conducted an exper experiment on race and religion that almost proved fatal for me. It was one year after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and I was a freshman at the California State University at Fullerton. The previous fall, I was one of 20 African American students who integrated in mass the university of about 2,000 students. We had all been specifically recruited to attend that college in that then ultra conservative lily white Orange County, California. Much of white America was anxious and on edge as the civil rights era was shifting into the black power movement. And more than 120 cities had experienced riots in the aftermath of the King assassination just the year before. The 15 females and the five males among us all had stellar academic records. 
We grew up in middle class or middle class aspiring homes. We had previously been accepted into other colleges, but decided to enroll at California State University at Fullerton because they had promised us all but a tuition free ride for our first year in exchange for the promise that we did not rebel, we would not rob, and we would not rape our classmates or professors. It was an offer that we were foolish to refuse. In 1969, I had already been preaching regularly for nine years, since the age of nine years old. My reputation as a preacher brought me to the attention of the Jesus people on campus. Jesus people were part of the Jesus movement. The Jesus movement was an evangelical Christian movement which began on the west coast of the United States in the 60s and eventually spread throughout North America, Europe, Central America, before subsiding in the late 1980s. Members of the movement were called Jesus people or sometimes referred to as Jesus freaks. This movement and the freaks that comprised it called the church back to a closer biblical picture of Christianity in which the gifts of the spirit would be restored to the church. So at Cal State Fullerton, all the Jesus freaks were white. I came to the attention of the Jesus people for several reasons. For one, I was a non-closeted church goer. Unlike most of my freshman classmates, I went to church on Sunday morning. Two, I was a curiosity and contradiction in the eyes of the Jesus people. In today's nomenclature, they would describe me as religious but not spiritual. Among other things, Jesus people understood being spiritual is not smoking, drinking, playing cards, going to the movies, or dancing. While I always went to church on Sunday morning and knelt down on my knees to pray, I lived for Friday and Saturday nights when I could demonstrate my extraordinary proficiency in smoking, drinking, playing cards, enjoying movies, and dancing. <laughs> Three, I had a target on my forehead. That target made me a prize in the eyes of the Jesus people. I was a popular black male on campus, a leader, and who in their estimation just might be an influencer in their ultimate attempts to convert black students. Out of my deep need for Christian community and distorted desire for authentic racial integration, I began attending Jesus people meetings. I never felt as though I really belonged. While I was attracted to their views on personal piety, I was frustrated about their total disinterest in what Jesus might have to say about issues in the public square. They never spoke about civil rights. They never talked about the budding feminist movement. They never talked about the raging war in Vietnam. And I realized that maybe, just maybe, I was being manipulated, and maybe, just maybe, the Jesus people and myself had different understandings and relationships with Jesus. So, I asked for time with my fellow freaks. <laughs> Having recently come across an article in the, 2000, the, the 1969 issue of Ebony Magazine about the quest for a black Christ and how that article received such powerful and positive and negative res responses from both black and white readers, I decided that I wanted the 50 or so of them and the one of me to explore the implications and impact of a racialized faith formation. And as I was a declared sociology of religion major, I conducted the following experiment. I took that copy of the, cor of the cover of Ebony Magazine for that year which had the picture of the black Christ. Then I began to describe some of the articles in it, talking about Albert Cleage and the Shrine of the Black Madonna, and how important this was in the lives of black people, and how this image was in inspiring us, and how it was drawing us closer to Christ. And then as I began to talk, I also began to tear the picture up into little bitty pieces, and then I threw it in the trash. Then I took this picture, and I began, and I'd barely gotten one quarter of an inch, 
and to Solomon's 1949 Head of Christ, when I was suddenly bum-rushed, thrown against the wall, and beaten by three or four husky white male Jesus freaks. Fortunately, within 10 seconds or so, saner students came to my rescue, pulled the guys off me, and escorted me safely out of the classroom and out of the campus building. I had expected a reaction, but not that one. I saw then that there is clearly a connection between race and religion. It was 50 years ago that I first experienced the interconnectedness of Christianity and a sense of white superiority and privilege. Little did I know then the extent to which Christianity serves as a major support for white supremacy. Rage. Yet, simultaneously, Christian can be one, Christianity can be one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, to it, resistance. The malformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ into advocacy for white supremacy is heresy, while the power of the gospel, especially a gospel as practiced by the marginalized, who know that the same Jesus is the Jesus who suffers and struggles and stands with them, that Jesus is our greatest hope of vanquishing its grip on the church and American society. Yesterday, I had the privilege of lecturing at William Drew College. 100 years before Solomon's 1949 Head of Christ was painted, this incredible private four-year liberal arts college was founded by the Missouri State Convention and endowed with a $10,000 gift by then state senator and Baptist layman, Dr. William Jewell. Dr. Jewell was a man of contradictions, contradictions strongly marked. He fought to abolish whipping posts and pillories. He was heralded as a humanitarian and an advocate for states' rights, church rights, and freedoms. There's some indication that Dr. Jewell took some actions against slavery, but he himself remained a slave owner until his death. In fact, slaves made the bricks and mortar used to build the beautiful and historic Jewel Hall, which I witnessed yesterday. How, how, how could an institution inspired by the gospel of Christ, founded as a Baptist college, located in Liberty, Missouri, reconcile being physically built by still enslaved great-grandchildren of Angolans brought to these shores 230 years before? What was going on in the mind and the spirit of slave-owning Dr. Jewell as he contributed over today would be over $300,000 of his wealth, money, and property with a direct line to slavery. Contradictions. Now, I only want to raise this reality here within the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ to show that this treasure is often located in cracked clay pots, the pots, great black clay pots of racism and white supremacy. But we still must think critically about the pots. Perhaps a more contemporary frame of this, framing of this question is, how do we explain the 81% of white evangelicals and 60% of Catholics voting for a candidate and now president who questioned whether President Obama was born in the United States or not, who condones the beating of Black Lives Matters protesters, claims a federal judge, an American citizen born in Indiana, is biased because, quote, he's a Mexican, discriminated against people of color seeking to rent properties in Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island, stereotyped Jews and shared anti-Semitic memes created by white supremacists, trash Native Americans and claimed that members of a particular tribe didn't like, like Indians to me and has repeatedly expressed disdain and demonstrated discrimination against people of Muslim faith. How could Christians vote for such an unabashedly racist candidate? The United States imagines itself to be a white Christian nation. If I did not believe this before the spring of 1969, I certainly believe it now. My back against the wall 50 years ago and the backs of people of color and non-Christian and other faiths against the wall today 
demonstrates that this pathetic imagination is a threat to religious liberty everywhere. If we truly desire a world of racial justice and religious integrity, understanding the sin of white supremacy, that is racial and Christian, and the church's role within it is an important step forward. Deneen Hill Fletcher in her book, The Sin of White Supremacy, Christianity, Racism, and Religious Diversity in America, helps us to begin to address some of these questions. Hill Fletcher tracks white racism back well before the beginning of slavery in America to the inscription of Christian supremacy. That is, there is no salvation outside the church. Many trace the origins of this idiom to third century Bishop Cyprian of Carthage who said, there can be no salvation to any except in the church. This supremacist theology fueled the crusades by the Latin church, campaigns in the Eastern Mediterranean aimed at recovering the Holy Land from the Muslim rule and later blessed the imperial stretch of Spain and Portugal into the so-called New World. Explorers and conquistadors were not just blinded by gold in their conquest, they were propelled and blinded by a Christian supremacist ideology. Pope Alexander VI looked with admiration on Christopher Columbus and his fleet, and he made this pronouncement. Among other works, well-pleasing to the divine majesty and cherished by our heart, this assuredly ranks the highest that in our times, especially the Catholic faith and the Christian religion, be exalted and be everywhere increased and spread, that the health and souls be cared for, and that barbarous nations be overthrown to the faith itself. The Pope then went on to theologize about God's plan for Christian humanity by declaring, that by the authority of Almighty God conferred on us and blessed Peter and the vicarship of Jesus Christ, which we hold on earth, do by tenor of these presents, should any of set islands have been found by your envoys and captain, give, grant, and assign to you and your heirs and successors, kings of Castile and Leon, forever together with their dominions, cities, camps, places, villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, appurtenances, all islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered towards the east and the south. In other words, whatever you want, take it in the name of Jesus Christ. The ultimate aim of this ideology was and is to justify material disposition of some people by privileging and making other people dominant. For instance, indigenous people were stewards of the land flowing with milk and honey, and Africa had what appeared to be an endless source of free labor. Europeans had Bibles and bullets. Today, African Americans and indigenous Americans are at the bottom of a practically, a practically every socioeconomic indicator. Tenahisi Coates is instructive in reminding us that race is a child of racism, not the father. By this he means that first, people were exploited for their resources, not initially according to how they looked. Europeans justified theft and domination by inventing race and then justifying it in the name of faith. Yes, it is true that the architects of the founding of this nation struggled to extend religious liberty but they simultaneously sought to extend Christendom with a goal towards subduing the entire earth. They employed their theological heritage to construct what would become a lasting, dominant way of thinking, justifying the exploitation of non-white, non-Christian peoples to attain and maintain privilege. This heritage included an understanding of cosmology as a great chain of being functioning as a hierarchy of God, Christ, and Christians at the top, and the remainder of humanity hierarchically ordered below. This predominant colonial theory included the idea that the human race could be lined up from superior to most inferior. That is, God, white people, then an arrangement of non-white people with blacks at the bottom. 
Charles White, in his account of the regular gradation of man and in, a different, uh, and in different animals and vegetables in 1799, ranks his assessment of superior to inferior. At the type, top of the chain are types of Euro Europeans, Romans, and Greeks. On the bottom of the chain are Asiatics, American savages, and Negroes. White also wrote, in whatever respect the Africans differ from the Europeans, the particularity brings him nearer to the ape, end quote. In a similar vein, in 1865, Andrew Peabody wrote concerning Native Americans, claiming that a law of divine providence caused some races to submit to those of superior physical and intellectual rigor. Under this law, the aborigines of North America, he says, will ultimately disappear. And the humane policy, he says, which ought to have been pushed, pursued to them from the first, would not have ensured their preservation in the land, though it would have averted the condemnation of blood guiltiness from the white settlers, end quote. The point here is that white supremacy is not just the result of individual bias, personalized discrimination, or horizontal hostility against blacks and other people of color in resource competition. There is a vertical dimension of white supremacy rooted in a conquesting Christian supremacist universalism which depicts non-Christians and people of color as ontologically other. With racial hierarchy as part of the so-called natural order of things, non-white, non-Christian others are assessed to be deficient on a sliding scale of humanity. With the absence of Christianity, a key determinant factor of greater or lesser humanity. This white racial framing, this long-term and persisting way of framing reality has created, was created in the origins of the United States and as a way of justifying the exploitation of non-white, non-Christian peoples from the very beginnings of American Christianity. Really, what evidence do we have that American Christianity is fundamentally committed to the equality of all humanity? Let me ask it again. What evidence do we really have that American Christianity is fundamentally committed to the equality of all humanity? Terrell Germain Starr, a senior writer for The Root, says it this way. If you do not believe that American Christianity has often been peddled as white supremacist doctrine, you know very little about how it functions in white mainstream society." End quote. Again, we saw lots of evidence of this in the election of 2016. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Camp uh, Association organized prayer rallies in, in all 50 states, spending over $10 million in 2016 to rally a backlash against the nation's first black president in God's name. For many evangelicals, Obama, both during his 2008 campaign and during his term as president, was seldom directly attacked for being black, though. Instead, the race question almost always got refracted through religion. For them, Obama was either questionably Christian, reference Jeremiah Wright, or really a Muslim. On the night of, election, of Trump's election, Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, celebrated with this prayer of thanksgiving. Oh God, political pundits were stunned. Many thought the Trump, tent, Trump Pence ticket didn't have a chance. None of them understand the God factor. While the media scratches their head and tries to understand how this happens, I believe that God's hand intervened, end quote. Our current president, undergirded by white evangelicals, persists in the belief that white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism is the, default, is, is the default for true American Christianity and is best suited to lead America as a Christian nation. 
But the Jesus I encountered in my youth and attempt to grow closer to with each passing year was a radical. Jesus protected the poor and never shamed the disadvantaged. Jesus rebuked the abuser of power and celebrated the least of these, the disenfranchised and the vulnerable. If there ever was an anti-colonial, anti-hierarchical force on this earth, it was Jesus. It was this Jesus who died upon a lynching tree to remind the marginalized everywhere, everywhere I know exactly what you're going through. I am with you, and I will be with you. How then shall we resist? I believe we resist through repentance and relinquishment. We are called to repent, repent of our complicity and tolerance of white supremacy. We are called to have the courage and the commitment to be honest about what has been done in the name of Jesus under the flag of God and what the very clear incarnational and structural damage has been done in the name of Christian supremacy. For white people, I would suggest that a very good place to start is by doing nothing other than taking a long, hard look at how hierarchy, how whiteness, and how Christianness itself, perhaps I might add maleness, privileges those who share these characteristics and often distorts and abuses the rest of God's creation. The church must repent of its stolid silence on the one hand, and on the other, divest itself as a participant in the maintenance and support of, on, uh, of the order which is destroying our life together. But you can't repent about what you don't know about. I went through an entire Master of Divinity degree in education and was never required to read one single book or article from a person of color, and I believe also not from a woman. But I know that's not the case in this season of theologues. Nevertheless, I commend to you some contemporary prophets like Emily Towns or Dwight Thomas Hopkins or Cornell West or Tracy Blackman, Ta-Nehisi Coates and others who give voice to the voiceless and help provide some of our hard and callous hearts to develop a want to, to be able to decide to want to be able to repent. And for black and brown and red people, may I suggest a good place to start is by repenting of and rejecting internalized images of ourselves imposed by an oppressive, self-denying, and self-destroying hierarchy. Let us stop apologizing for the particularities of our own sacred faces and liminal spaces. Being white does not make one right. We must repent of any notion that we are less than or other than the beautiful, divinely endowed persons and people that God created us to be. Gone are the days when you have to go to the kitchen when company comes. You have a right to be here. Take your place. Make your place at the welcome table and eat and grow strong and demand that your table mates know that you are here. But then we must also resist through reimagining evangelism. Evangelicals are almost obsessive about evangelism. When I came to leadership at ABC USA, the one abiding, enduring question that was constantly asked of me, what are you going to do about evangelism? What are you going to do about church planning? Well, I'll tell you this. <laughs> Our notion of evangelism more closely resembles the doctrine of discovery than it does the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need to reimagine and rethink evangelism. I recently came across this announcement as a flyer in one of our Baptist churches. Win a soul today. To grow our church, every member is asked to win at least one soul to Christ. The individual who wins the most souls for Christ will receive a $1,000 gift card for the Christmas holiday. We are called to witness for our glorious Jesus Christ. If it wasn't so pathetic, it would be funny. That mindset is a gross distortion of the Great Commission. 
Jesus did not instruct his followers to mount a worldwide winter soul for, for Jesus' crusade, chalking up souls like notches on a belt and as a mission target of opportunity to advance our notions of empire, religious, or otherwise. Jesus commissions us to show how passionate God is about restoring community with all humanity and creation. The Great Commission directs followers to call people to follow Jesus Christ in building a world house where the interrelatedness of humanity and all creation to God is based on the cruciform call to love God with all of our heart and mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Howard Thurman called this the beloved community, not Christian version of empire. Disciples are not simply believers. Disciples are becomers and belongers and countercultural behaviors, behaviors in an inclusive and just community. Finally, we resist through reparation and reconciliation. How do we move supremacy from supremacy hierarchy and ranking to a place of reparation and reconciliation. In other words, in the words of J. Cameron Carter, how do we rearrange the social calculus so that bodies and social spaces are ordered with dignity and justice in community? May I suggest that the road forward is not simply a kumbaya moment of us exploring, can't we all just get along? Nor must it take the form of some financial big payback to those victimized by the last 500 plus years by empire and supremacy. The best way to repair the value of land and labor and lives stolen and lost in the first place is to overcome the society that that theft was built on in the first place. Reconciliation is not about damaged or damaged or demeaning bodies coming to feel comfortable in a settled space of death and disease. We must overcome the theft and the society that built it in the first place. The project of reconciliation is daring to learn a new calculus of a decol decolonizing of a society that was built through bad things. Jesus talks about this as the kingdom of God. The question for today is how we go about futurizing it. Will we futurize it as pie in the sky when we die? Or will we futurize it in a way that my foreparents internalized the hope for reality of tomorrow by digging in and fighting and working for those hope for realities today? No. To paraphrase Langston Hughes, well, the fight for racial justice and religious liberty has been no crystal stair for us. The staircase has always had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up, places with no carpet on the floor, simply bare. But all the time, we've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there has been no light. So brothers and sisters, don't turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps simply because you find it's hard work. Don't fall down. Keep on climbing. Keep on rising. Can't you see James Dunn at the top of the stairs saying to each of us, keep on climbing, keep on rising, keep on going, don't fall down. Can't you see Fannie Lou Hammer at the top of the stairs saying to each and every one of us, don't fall down, keep on climbing, keep on rising. Can't you see John Leland at the top of the stairs saying to each and every one of us, don't fall down, keep on climbing, don't you get tired. Can't you hear the BJC saying to each and every one of us today, don't fall down, keep on climbing, keep on rising. Let us resist, let us rise, let us go forward. Thank you. Thank you.